All right, hello, hello. We are going to do Numbers chapter 14 today. So, we just finished off where Caleb and Joshua were the only ones who really stood by their faith when they went in and scouted out the land of Canaan. Everyone else started spreading rumors among the Israelites about how they would never be able to conquer the land. So, everyone's getting nervous, scared, as always, because outside of Moses and Joshua and Caleb, there's not a lot of people of faith, it seems like, among the Israelites. Um, so, we're going to get into chapter 14, which is kind of like the aftermath of them spreading around all these exaggerated rumors about how it's impossible to conquer Canaan. <clears throat> Verse 1. That night, all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, of course. And the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt or in the wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, Would we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt? All right, so... They've seen God perform miracles in Egypt, getting out of Egypt, in the wilderness. Every step along the way, God has shown them that even though it seems like there's no way, he provides a way. And they still are like, yeah, but this obstacle's too big. This one. Like, they don't learn. They're not getting better <laughs> as time goes on. They just keep making the same mistake. Now, this is true for a lot of us. I'm sure that a lot of you keep having that stumbling block but this is the thing is <clears throat> and God will keep 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 providing but you have to at some point realize that hey God has always taken care of me God's always provided a way he's always given me a door or a window or some way to get away from or out of or through this hardship they are not understanding this so <laughs> They haven't even seen the people in Canaan, just, just the ones who had the scout, and they're already like, oh, we'd be better off as slaves in Egypt, where they genocide a whole generation of our people, uh, all of our kids, you know, they killed them for population control. But that would be better than this, because God's, clearly God's not strong enough to help us defeat these people. <laughs> right? They're just weak of faith. Uh, then Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole Israelite assembly gathered there. Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes and said to the entire Israelite assembly, The land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord. And do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. But the whole assembly talked about stoning them. <laughs> like, shut up! <laughs> you who have faith, you know, blessed is he who is persecuted in my name's sake sort of thing. Like, these people, Josh, Caleb, are like, we have faith the whole israelite assembly all hundreds of thousands of them were like we gotta go back to egypt give us a leader that will take us back to egypt moses doesn't know what he's doing this is awful he's only you know protected us and led us this far but now this is too great and joshua and caleb who actually were there were like no we can do it we can do this if we just obey the lord if we just have faith he will protect us and he will lead us to victory but they're like, stone them. <laughs> uh, that's so funny to me. Then the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to all the Israelites. So finally the Lord's like, all right, again, I got to show my presence to them. You know, the, the Mount Sinai, every, the Mount Sinai, everything that he's done, they still don't have faith. The Lord said to Moses, how long will these people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe in me? In spite of all the signs I have performed among them, I will strike them down with a plague and destroy them, but I will make you into a nation greater and stronger than they. So again, I'm pretty sure this has already happened twice, if not once, 
where he's like, Moses, I'm just going to make your line my new covenant. These guys have broken the covenant like time and time again. I'm sick of them. And we'll, we'll turn to the commentary. Basically, you'll see Moses will beg for their forgiveness, as he always does. So the commentary. All the children complained. The murmuring was directed first against Moses and Aaron, but since these were the Lord's leaders, they really murmured against the Lord. Yeah, it's, I keep bringing this up, but it's like the whole Elisha and the bear thing where he sticks it on those two kids. Those two kids were attacking a man of the Lord. You're attacking the Lord. Okay, then that's not saying that making fun of priests is attacking the Lord or anything like that, but making fun or going after a godly man who's only doing God's will, only trying to lead you to God, is going against God, just like Christ. You know, whether you believe that Christ was the physical manifestation of God, whether he's the son of God, whatever you believe, what is apparent is he was only ever doing God's will. And he was persecuted for it. That's the basically the just of, gist of the world. We see it all the way back here in Numbers, all the way through. If you are serving the Lord, you will be accosted and persecuted by people in this world because they don't like it. They don't like, uh, how do I say this? It's not like, I guess. They don't have faith. They don't truly believe that the Lord is all powerful, that the Lord is all good. Okay? So they will accost and attack and attack. And that's what's going on here. There were probably some among the Israel, Israel who claimed to truly trust God and claimed their problem was with Moses and Aaron, not with God. Yet, but what did Moses and Aaron, so they didn't believe that Moses and Aaron were truly serving God, maybe? Yet, since Moses and Aaron were properly directed towards God's goal for Israel, on this point to complain against them was to complain against God. Yeah, if a man is doing God's will and only doing God's will and you attack him for that specifically like if Moses had done something against God's will then fine attack them for it or persecute them for it but he wasn't and they were persecuting him for doing what God told them to do Joshua and Caleb understood this was rebellion against Yahweh only do not rebel against the Lord that's what they said in verse 9 Uh, moving on, they want to go back to Egypt, yeah. Israel rejected a life of faith. If God intended to lead them into a deeper trust than before, they wanted no part of it. If God gave them the promised land without having to receive it by faith and faith-filled actions, that was fine with Israel, but they did not want to walk, want a walk of faith. Yeah, they just wanted to give it to them. They didn't want, and again, it's not on us as far as like, uh, we can save ourselves necessarily. Christ is the one who saved us. You know, God giving him as a, uh, a sacrifice for our sins. But at the same time, you have to take the faith walk. You knock and the door shall be open. Ask and you shall receive. You have to walk that narrow path. You have to knock on the door. You have to ask. You have to do the walk of faith. So it is somewhat up to you and your decisions and how you decide to go forward. The path is there for you. The door is not locked, but you have to go up to the door. You have to knock. You have to be the one to walk the walk of faith. It won't just be given to you. You know, you're not going to get a, a segue that powers you through the door. You have to do the walking yourself. All right. Verse 13. Moses said to the Lord, <clears throat> Oh, wait, here we go. Yeah, Moses said to the Lord, Then the Egyptians will hear about it. By your power you brought these people up from among them, and they will tell the inhabitants of this land about it. They have already heard that you, Lord, are with these people, and that you, Lord, have been seen face to face, that your cloud stays over them, and that you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day, in a pillar of fire by night. If you put all these people to death, leaving none alive, the nations who have heard this report about you will say, the Lord was not able to bring these people into the land he promised them an o on oath, so he slaughtered them in the wilderness. Yeah, 
Now, again, God's all-knowing. He knows this stuff. A lot of these things, like these debates or discussions that Moses has with God, it's not necessarily Moses changing God's mind. It's us. It's God getting Moses to understand what's really going on. You know, it's like a, a teacher who knows the answer but kind of walks you into understanding it yourself by kind of playing the everyman. Uh, playing like the like Norm Macdonald talks about, you know, you play the everyman, the the dummy, like you don't understand it, so that and then people will come to understand it on their own. The Lord replied, "I have for I forget have forgiven them as you asked." Okay, here we go. Now may the Lord's strength be displayed just as you have declared. The Lord is slow to anger, abundant abounding in love and forgiving sin and rebellion yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished he punishes the children of this for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation in accordance to in accordance with your great love forgive the sin of these people just as you have pardoned them from the time they left egypt until now so moses is begging for the forgiveness and he also says like hey if you do this all these other people who are around here will say that you killed them because you weren't able to lead them into the promised land. You didn't have the strength and your name will be down. Even though we want to raise your name up as priests and a blessing to the world is what we're supposed to be. If you wipe us out, they'll use that as an excuse saying that you weren't strong enough to overcome these other people and their gods and whatnot. Uh, but Big Bear talks a lot about, you know, to the third and fourth generation. His interpretation, I think, is more accurate than a lot of Bibles in that it's not like God's punishing the great-grandson for the sins of the grandfather. It's that your weakness of faith or your uh, shortcomings get passed on. Like, we emulate our fathers we emulate our grandfathers you know it gets passed on and it gets watered down with time but usually it's not until the third or fourth generation that that uh weakness or you know sin or whatever it is that cur that the original person did is really wiped away you know big bear talks about how his dad broke a cycle and how he's trying to break cycles and if each generation tries to break them then by the third or fourth yeah it's broken but how often do people really try and break them? That's why it talks about how to the third and fourth generation, you're still being punished for the sins of your grandfathers because that sticks around. You know, uh, look at slavery, okay? I'm not trying to, I know everyone makes a big deal now about, you know, reparations and slavery, but the fact that ancestors owned slaves and particularly participate in the slave trade that is still the sin of that is still punishing people today we're still dealing with the fallout from generations later third fourth generation because of that original sin it's not that we are uh god's directly like throwing punishment and plagues at us it's that that sin carries weight with it you know it's it's the rules of this world that it's gonna cause people to continue to be mad and angry at you because of what your grandfather did the lord replied i have forgiven them as you ask nevertheless as surely as i live and as surely as the glory of the lord fills the whole earth not one of those who saw my glory and the signs i performed in egypt and in the wilderness but who disobeyed me and tested me ten times. Not one of them will ever see the land I promised on oath to the ancestors. No one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. But because my servant Caleb was different, has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went to and his descendants will inherit it. Since the Amalekites and the Canaanites are living in the valley, turn back tomorrow and set out toward the desert along the route of the Red Sea. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, How long will this wicked community grumble against me? Yeah, God's getting sick of it. Okay, He's constantly providing for them, constantly taking care of them, and all they do is complain and have lack of faith. Sound sound like... I mean, this is one reason why I understand the agnostic, but the like angry at God atheist type of people really 
are annoying to me because like, you provided so much in this world and you're still complaining because it's not like I'm not sure if God exists like the agnostic you know who hasn't totally understand it or doesn't you know fully accept it but they're not angry about you know there's a lot of atheists who believe in God but they're atheists because they're angry at God they they don't want they don't think God's doing a good enough job and that's kind of what's going on here they're grumbling against him I have heard the complaints of these grumbling Israelites so tell them as surely as I live declares the Lord I will do to you the very thing I heard you say in this wilderness your bodies will fall yeah he's like okay this is what you thought was gonna happen all right now it's gonna happen in the wilderness your bodies will fall every one of you 20 years old or more who has counted who has counted in the census and who has grumbled against me not one of you will enter the land i swore and uplifted hand to, uplifted hand to make your home except caleb son of jephunneh and joshua son of nun as for the children that you said would be taken as plunder i will bring them in to enjoy the land you have rejected but as for you, your bodies will fall in this wilderness. Your children will be shepherds here for 40 years, suffering for your unfaithfulness until the last of your bodies lies in the wilderness. For 40 years, one year for each of the 40 days you explored the land, you will suffer for your sins and know that it is like to have me against you. What it is like to have me against you. I, the Lord, have spoken. And I will surely do these things to this whole wicked community, which has banded together against me. They will meet their end in the wilderness. Here they will die. Not only that, like 20 plus 40 is only 60. 60 is not old at this time. So a lot of them are going to end up dying young. All right, let's turn to the commentary quickly. We read quite a bit there. Let's see if there's anything extra. All right, so so when he offered to make Moses a nation, and that was an impressive proposal. God offered him the status of patriarch, like Abraham. He's going to be the new Abraham is what God's offering him, to become a father for Israel in the same way Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were. Moses certainly knew of their greatness and fame. God used Moses to compile their stories in the book of Genesis. You must regard this as a genuine proposal from God. The Lord does not speak make-believe words. Yeah, I agree, but I also know that God knows the end from the beginning. He knew what Moses' answer would be when he did that. And he wanted Moses, it's kind of like reaffirming in Moses his dedication to the people as well. Uh... If Moses were to do nothing, this plan of God would go in effect, into effect. The, present, the presently constituted people of Israel would perish, and God would make a new people of Israel descended from Moses. God even promised Moses that this new nation would be greater and mightier than the present one. About a year before this, God made a similar offer to Moses, yep, proposing to make a great nation of him. So then Moses responds, It seems that Moses did not consider God's proposal for a moment. Instead, Moses pleaded for the nation and loved them despite the rebellion. In a way, God's using this debate, this discussion with Moses to show his own love for the people. Again, sure, you can call it a genuine offer, but also know that God knows <laughs> what we're going to do ahead of time. So he knew what Moses' response was going to be. So then it talks about Moses' response about everyone's heard what you did in Egypt, uh, and if you don't, if you do wipe them out, then you know it'll make it seem like you did it because you wouldn't have been able to conquer Canaan. Moses asked God to spare the present nation of Israel for his own glory and reputation. You know, he he said you have to spare these people for you, and again, that's Moses showing glory to God. If God struck and disinherited the present nation and started again with Moses, it would be a mark against his reputation before the nations, especially Egypt. Perhaps the, the, the nations could claim that the Lord was not able to bring this people to the land. The pagan nations could say that the sin and rebellion of man were greater than the power and goodness of God.
All right, so let's turn back to the verses here. So verse 36, So the men Moses had sent to explore the land who returned and made the whole community grumble against him by spreading a bad report about it. These men who were responsible for spreading the bad report about the land were struck down and died of a plague before the Lord. Of the men who went to explore the land, only Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, survived. So think about that. You were chosen because of your status in the community, because of your weak faith. And not only your weak faith, but the fact that you spread your weak faith. You know, how often do people do that? Was it misery loves company? People will, if you're down in the dumps or if you're doubtful, you want other people to be doubtful so you don't feel so inferior and so weak. If, if you're the only one who's unfaithful and doubtful of what God can do, you're going to feel weak. But if everyone else feels that way, then great. And here they're trying to get everyone else to do to feel that way. So they're grumbling and exaggerating. And it's kind of like the, the verse that Jesus talks about. You know, everyone remembers his thing about better is he, he should tie a millstone around his neck and throw him in. And right before that, though, he's talking about who is the people who should throw, tie a millstone around their neck and jump into the water. It's the people who lead other people to sin. Like right before that, Jesus is saying that it's important to remember that everyone will fall, everyone will sin, but woe to the one who leads them to sin, knowingly leads them against God. That's why these men are struck down immediately, because woe unto them. They led the people away from God purposefully, knowingly. When Moses reported to the, reported this to all the Israelites, they mourned bitterly. Early the next morning, they set out for the highest point in the hill country, saying, Now we are ready to go to the land the Lord promised. Surely we have sinned. But Moses said, Why are you disobeying the Lord's command? This will not succeed. Do not go up, because the Lord is not with you. You will be defeated by your enemies, for the Amalekites and the Canaanites will face you there. Because you have turned away from the Lord, he will not be with you, you and, and you will fall by the sword. So after, you know, these people are struck down and Moses gives God's proclamation. Now they're like, oh, no, 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 we'll go, we'll go take the land. We, we can do it. We can do it now. Because <laughs> they're scared of God again. And Moses is like, no, it's, it's too late. You missed your chance. You already showed your true colors. Nevertheless, in their presumption, they went up toward the highest point in the hill country, though neither Moses nor the Ark of the, Lord coven of the Lord's covenant moved from the camp. Then the Amalekites and the Canaanites who lived in the hill country came down and attacked them and beat them down all the way to Hormah. What did you expect? So, not a lot of commentary that I can add there. Let's see what the Enduring Word Bible says. Uh, to me, it's a very straightforward scripture, chapter, verse here. Uh, do, 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 do. So Moses spoke for God, warning Israel that they could not escape the consequences of their sin on the previous day. So yeah, they're like, oh, we sinned, yeah, but now now we're ready. He's like, no, it's not going to work now. I mean, it's kind of like if you have children, you know, you give your child an ultimatum. You say, you know, uh, you got to you gotta eat your vegetables, and when you get done, we'll watch an episode of your favorite show. I'm like, no, I don't want to eat my vegetables. Look, if you, if you don't eat vegetables like i told you then we're not going to get to watch your favorite show I'm like no no and they throw a fit and they leave the table and they're crying and moaning so you you know you unplug the tv you turn off the tv you say no no you're not watching your show and they're like well no i'll, I'll eat my vegetables now i'll eat my vegetables now and it's like no it's too late i mean yeah it, you missed your chance you're not going to get the reward that i promised because you the way you just acted you know, it's too late now. Now that you see the consequences, now that they've already been enacted, now, now you want to, you know, do what I told you. But you didn't want to do it earlier out of just faith, you know, out of just trusting in me. And then they're beaten. So uh, this is where Numbers, to me, starts getting more exciting. I like history. I like uh, ancient history and things like this. This is more historical stuff. So it's far more interesting to me to see the way that uh, the civilizations interact with each other and what led to what. And 
the main takeaway is trust the Lord. Like, have faith. Don't persecute those who are trying to lead you in the way of the Lord. Okay? That so often is the case. So many people who are just simply trying to lead you to the Lord are the ones who you attack, people attack the most. Because usually the Lord's asking you to do something you don't necessarily want to do. You know, we always want to take the easy route, the broad road. God wants us to take the narrow road, the narrow gate. We don't want to do it. And then we don't do it. And the people who try to lead us that way, who try to tell us, no, this is the way we have to go, then we get mad at them and we persecute them. We look for reasons to blame them and attack them. And this is what the Israelites do. And they're also complainers. They're such whiners. Whine, 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 whine. You know, Big Bear talks a lot about, you know, Jews having victim mentality, status in uh, their nature. And you can actually see it all the way back here in the Old Testament. It is true. It, they have this constant victim mentality. I'm not saying that's just a Hebrew thing. You know, it's many cultures, many people from all over the place. But if you have that, woe is us, woe is us, always woe is us then that's like a slap in the face to God because you're not a victim. God is taking care of you. God is providing for you. And if you just trust in him, he will continue to do that. But so often we complain. Anyway, hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon, evening, or good night. God bless.